One of the most difficult decisions any judge faces is whether to allow one parent to move away from the other parent after separation or divorce. It is hard because the children can lose most if not all of their relationship with the parent who stays behind. While judges can sometimes be suspicious that the move may be a tactic by a vindictive ex to cleanse the other parent out of their life and the lives of the children, often there are really good reasons for the move and it can be hard to balance all the positive benefits that the move offers to the children against losing a relationship with the parent. When the federal and Ontario governments changed the family laws in March 2021, they made them more specific as to when moves should and should not be allowed. This episode of the Ontario Family Law Podcast goes over what a parent must know and must do if he or she thinks he may need to move with the kids. I'm John Schumann, a certified specialist in family law in Ontario. I'm also a mediator, arbitrator, and collaborative lawyer. This podcast is a companion to my book, Guide to the Basics of Ontario Family Law, which is available on the iBookstore, Amazon, Kobo, and in fine bookstores. Moving the children is always hard. It is even more so after separation and divorce as parents have to take their children's relationship with their ex into account. Whenever a court has to make a parenting decision, it must consider how well each parent has promoted the children's relationship with the other parent. So doing anything to compromise that relationship can get a parent into trouble in court. I went over that in more detail in episode number 59. Following the law whenever moving the children is very important. Parents and judges and even the police get suspicious when someone suddenly changes a child's residence without notice. Whenever a separated parent or anyone else who has an order to have contact with ch children wants to move, he or she must tell the other parent, regardless of how big or small the move. The only exception to this is if the parent gets permission from a judge because he or she is fleeing domestic violence or some other similar concerns. This is important regardless of how far the parent is moving so that the other parent knows where to pick up the kids and generally where the kids will be when they are with the other parent. Unless a judge says otherwise, every parent and anyone else who has an order for contact with the kids, such as a grandparent with an actual court order letting them see the kids, has to send a written notice to the other parents and people with contact stating that they are going to move and when. If the move will require any change in the parenting or contact schedule, then the moving parent must, at least 60 days before any move, serve a formal written notice in a form set by the government. They are unavailable online, but can be hard to find. I will post the link. Also, know that there are rules for how one parent must give that notice to the other parent that are very similar to the rules for service of court documents. The moving parent may find it necessary to hire a lawyer or a process server to make sure that this is done properly so that the notice counts and the other parent cannot invalidate it. The required form includes not just the date of the move and the new contact location, but it also requires the moving parent to include a proposal for the parenting arrangements after the move. That proposal is really important and it is one of the things that a judge or arbitrator will consider in deciding whether to allow a move if the other parent with decision-making authority or parenting time opposes the move. If the parent moving with the children does not receive an objection within 30 days and there is no court order prohibiting the move, then the parent can move with the children. If there is an objection, then unless the parents reach an agreement, a court order or a family arbitration award that can be converted into a court order is necessary to allow the move. Note that it is, the move, it is moving the children that matters. If the children are going to stay in the same place and the parent is going to move away, then the parent is free to do that but it will still be important to make a proposal and try to reach an agreement or get a court order to set out how the children will continue to have a relationship with the parent that moved. But if a parent wants to move with the children over another parent's objections, the changes to the law in 2021 make things very different from the way they were done before, including how judges will decide the case. There are several things that parents will want to consider, even plan for, before anyone serves a notice of relocation. A judge or arbitrator should only allow a parent to move the children away from another parent over that other parent's objection if doing so is in the best interest of the child. 
but who is responsible for proving what is in the child's best interest can obviously have a big impact on the case. When the child spends the vast majority of his or her time with the moving parent, it is the objecting parent who must prove that the move is not in the child's best interest. In other words, it is almost like an assumption that the move will be in the child's best interest unless the other parent can show otherwise. And since the child spends the vast majority of their time with the moving parent, and the moving parent is the child's primary parent, it will be hard to show that having the children stay behind while their parent moves is in the child's best interest. It will not be impossible for a parent who spends a little time with the children to prevent a move, but it will be an uphill battle against an opponent with more weapons. It will be very hard to win that fight. So if the prospect of a parent moving is on the horizon when the parents work out the parenting schedule, this will definitely be something to keep in mind. Those would be good circumstances to speak to a family lawyer to make sure things work out for you and the kids in the long term. Things are the opposite when the children spend a substantially equal amount of time with each parent. In those cases, the parent who wants to move the children has to show that doing so is in the child's best interest. The move will have a negative impact on the child's relationship with the non-moving parent in circumstances where the child probably has a close relationship with that parent because they spend a lot of time together, just about as much time as with the moving parent. This will make it hard for the moving parent to justify the move because the child may have two primary parents or at least a very significant relationship with both parents. As I noted in episode 59, the strength of a child's relationship with a parent and the ability of each parent to promote a child's relationship with the other parent are two factors the judge considers in deciding what is in the child's best interest. So where a parent wants to move the children in a shared parenting situation, he or she will have a very difficult case to make. For temporary moves, neither parent has the burden. It falls on both parents to convince the judge or arbitrator what is in the child's best interest when the children will be away for a short time, but will be back before there is a trial or arbitration hearing. In those cases, the judge considers what both parents think will be in the child's best interest in the short term when there is an expectation that the children will be moving back again before the judge has to make a final parenting order. In episode 59, I went over all the factors that a judge or arbitrator has to consider when deciding what is in a child's best interest. But in cases where a parent wants to move the children, judges and arbitrators are required to consider some additional factors when deciding what is in the child's best interest. First, the judge or arbitrator must consider the reasons for the move. This is a big change to the way the law was before because before, judges were not supposed to consider the reason for the move. Now the law recognizes that the reason for the move can relate directly to the best interest of the child. For example, a move might enable a parent to earn a significantly higher salary, improving the financial circumstances for the child. On the flip side, a parent wanting to move just to get away from the other parent or to prevent the child from having a relationship with the other parent can really harm the children. There are many reasons why a family might have to move and it's important for the court to be aware of them. Second, the judge or arbitrator must consider the impact of the relocation on the child. That has an obvious link to what is in the child's best interest. This is a broad category that can include things such as the child moving away from friends, what the new school may be like, whether there are adequate services available for a child who has special needs, and what the general situation looks like in a proposed neighborhood. The third additional factor that a judge or arbitrator must consider in deciding whether to let a child move is the amount of time spent with the child by each person who has parenting time and the level of involvement in the child's life of each of those persons. As I mentioned before, the strength or lack thereof of the child's relationship with the parent who may be staying behind is a big consideration. The fourth additional consideration is whether the person who intends to relocate the child complied with any applicable notice requirement. I mentioned before that providing notice properly is important, but it is more than just checking to make sure the parent complied with the legal obligations before trying to move the child. How well a parent followed relevant, obli relevant obligations such as the notice requirement set out in law may reflect the importance that a parent places on the child's relationship with the other parent. That is another important factor the judge must consider. In addition, whether a parent complied with the legal notice requirements may also provide information about the likelihood that that parent will comply with future orders. 
That can be important if the parent wants to move out of the jurisdiction or if obedience to a court order will otherwise be critical to the child having a relationship with the non-moving parent. The next consideration is related. Has the parent who wants to move complied with their other family law obligations? Again, this will tell the judge or arbitrator whether the moving parent will follow the terms and a relocation order that benefit the parent staying behind. If a parent proposes to move a child who was consistently refused to allow the other parent to be with the child during court-ordered parenting time, that is relevant to a court's determination of whether they are likely to comply with the new parenting arrangements after the move, especially if the parent is moving out of the court's jurisdiction. On the other hand, it would be relevant if a parent who was consistently refused to pay child support opposes a move that would allow the other parent to take a job promotion with a higher salary. That move would benefit the children because it would allow the children to have the financial security that they are not getting from the parent who opposes the move. The sixth additional consideration is the existence of an order, arbitration award, or agreement that specifies the geographic area in which the child is to reside. So if the parents have agreed to a separation agreement or a court has already made an order that restricts how far a parent can move, the judge or arbitrator must take that into account when deciding whether to allow a further move. The law does leave open that the judge or arbitrator could disregard the agreement if circumstances warrant. I just discussed the circumstances in which a judge might set aside a domestic contract in previous episodes. I also have an episode on how to change an existing order. But judges will be heavily persuaded by an agreement between parents that keeping a child in a certain area is in the child's best interest. The next consideration is one that is certainly going to weigh heavily on the minds of judges and arbitrators deciding these cases. It is the reasonableness of the moving parent's proposal for the children to have a relationship with the parents staying behind. A parent who wants to move has to put his or her proposal in the notice that he or she gives to the other parent right at the start. Obviously, a proposal that prefers both parents' relationships with the children may avoid a fight over whether the children can move. But if there is a disagreement, then the judge or arbitrator may want to see the parent who is proposing the move also proposing ways for the children to spend lots of time with the other parent. A proposal that suggests cutting one parent out of the children's lives is unlikely to win approval and may prevent the move. As well, a proposal that suggests that mo the moving parent is motivated by vengeance will prevent a move as well. But a proposal that manages to maintain a relationship with both parents and the kids while giving the kids new opportunities can be very attractive to a judge or arbitrator. The judge may also have to consider the Hague Convention on the civil aspects of international child abduction if the child has not been in Canada long enough to be resident here. The court that had jurisdiction over parenting and moving with the children is a court where the children ordinarily reside. If the children are only in Ontario because a parent has suddenly taken them away from the other parent, then the Ontario courts will not take jurisdiction until the children are settled here or unless there is some form of immediate safety concern that cannot be addressed in the court for the place where the children came from. Until children are settled into their new home, they have a permanent address, school, friends and activities, the court that decides where they should stay there is the court with jurisdiction from where the children came from. While considering all of these factors, a judge is specifically not allowed to consider whether the moving parent will still move if the children are not going to as well. Before, parents who were seeking to move with their children were sometimes required to answer in court the difficult question of whether or not they would still move if they were not permitted to bring their children. If their parent responded, I won't relocate without my child, that might have been interpreted as evidence that the proposed move was not sufficiently important and should not be permitted. If the parent answered, I would relocate without my child, the court might have interpreted that evidence as that the parent is not sufficiently devoted to the child. The question could be put the parent in an impossible situation where any answer could be used against them. Under the new law, the judge or arbitrator must focus on what would be best for the child instead. There are exceptions to all these rules where the parent or the children are fleeing from family violence or a significant safety concern. In those cases, a judge may initially allow a move without requiring the moving parent to give notice or say where he or she is going with the children. Dangers to the welfare of the children can take precedence over all other considerations. 
Still, in most cases where there is shared parenting, it will be difficult for one parent to move away with the children. In most cases where the children spend most of their time with one parent, that court judge or arbitrator is likely to let the parent move because it will likely be in the children's best interest to move or to stay with their primary parent. In shared parenting, the parent who wants to move must convince the judge or arbitrator that the move is best for the children. Where there is a primary parent who wants to move, the opposing parent must prove that it is not in the children's best interest to move. Whether the children can move away with one parent will always depend on what is in the children's best interest, and the judge or arbitrator must apply certain factors to make that determination. But which parent has to come up with the evidence and prove the case can have a big impact on whether the move happens or not. If you need some more general family law guidance or you need to understand Ontario family law matters better so you can make better decisions and have your separation and divorce work out better for you or your children, get a copy of my book, The Guide to the Basics of Ontario Family Law. You can access it immediately on the iBookstore, on Amazon for the Kindle version, or you can download it for Kobo. Amazon can deliver the paperback version directly to your doorstep. You can also get a lot more Ontario Family Law information on www.schumanlaw.ca. Not only are there hundreds of pages of Family Law information and links, but there are links to where to get my book and links to reach my office, meet with either me or one of my colleagues. Because it is always best to get a lawyer who can give you expert advice that is specific to your situation. If you can't get through on my website, call me at 416-446-5847. In addition to my website, keep up to date on family and children's law issues by liking my Facebook page, following me on Twitter at HumanFamilaw, and finding me on LinkedIn. You can get the audio versions of the Ontario Family Law Podcast on all major podcast services, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iTunes, and many more. They are available at www.schumanlaw.ca as well. Of course, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to keep up to date. Thanks for participating in this podcast. We will get together again soon.